Okay, last time we talked about the mechanics of matrix multiplication. We talked about how the parts of the, the two matrices combine and how, what we can learn about, uh, about how matrix multiplication works by thinking about how the matrix from the left acts sort of column-wise and matrix from the right, excuse me, the matrix from the left acts sort of row-wise and matrix from the right acts sort of column-wise. And uh, so, of course, the check-in has to do with that. So let's see, let's have a look here. It says um, they get, uh, have a, a given matrix, just kind of a made up, not too hard matrix, and it says find an H to, to, to make this come out. So I'm gonna think about how the parts on the left combine with the parts on the right, and then I'm gonna, uh, gonna see what happens. Okay, okay, great. All right, so let's see, it goes, um, it is uh, one, uh, three, two, four, and I want that to be multiplied by another two by two matrix, A, B, C, D, and it's supposed to come out to be the identity matrix, one, zero, zero, one. So uh, if, if you think about how the parts combine, of course, what happens is the, the row, one, three, combines with the column, A, C, to give this one. So I'm simply looking at uh, A plus three, C, equals 1, and of course a person can guess where I'm going with this. We're going to do Gauss's method on a linear system. Uh, likewise, the 1 and the 3 combines with the B and the D to give me what uh, uh, B plus 3D, B plus 3D equals this 0 over here. And then you just proceed in that way. 2A plus 4C, 2A plus 4C equals 0. And then the last one is the 2 and the 4 combined with the B and the D, so 2B plus 4D equals 1. And it's a linear system, so you know we, we know exactly what to do. Off we go. So uh, I guess uh, I'm going to do what? Uh, minus, minus 2 row 1 plus row 2. And then my notes say I'm also going to do minus 2, minus 2, row 2 plus row 4. And I'll spare you the details of exactly what happens there, row 2 plus row 4. Row 4, I'll spare you the details of exactly what happens there. I end up with, uh, I'll copy it down here, it's uh, A plus 3C equals 1, A plus 3C equals 1, and then B plus 3D equals 0 plus 3D equals 0, and then I happen to get minus 2C equals minus 2, minus 2C equals minus 2, and then uh, minus 2D, minus 2D is equal to 1. I'm not just simply sparing you the, the agony of the uh, of the of watching me do arithmetic, which is which is agonizing. So uh, I get uh, from the bottom line that D is minus a half, D is minus a half, uh, C is 1 here, C is 1. And then I'm looking here at B plus 3D equals 0. So I get that what B is 3 halves. Okay, and then the last one is uh, A plus 3, uh, A plus 3 times 1 gives 1. So A is minus 2. Okay, and then so the conclusion is that um, what the 1, 3, 2, 4, uh, minus 2, B is 3 halves, C is 1, and D is uh, minus a half, uh, works out to be 1, 0, 0, 1. And just, just just to check one, how about if we check this three halves here? Just just just, just pick one at random. So I need the uh, I need the one three combined with the three halves minus one half. So one times three halves, three times minus one half. Yes, yeah, sure enough, sure enough. Okay, okay. Okay, so we can understand how the parts combine and we can answer questions about the matrices entirely uh, uh, independent of, entirely without regard to, the underlying uh, linear maps. It's not that I'm throwing away the underlying linear maps at this point. I'm only pointing out that one thing a person can do to solve problems is to just think about how the parts combine, that's all, and ignore the linear maps. That's perfectly, in lots of problems, that's perfectly practical. Just because we take the point of view in this class that linear maps are 
are primary and that matrices are, uh, are a computational aspect, computational shade, uh, uh, the, the computation, the way of computing linear maps, doesn't mean that matrices are, are just baloney and we'll never think about them again. It, rather, it's more complicated than that. Then when matrices are the way to think about something, then we'll think about them that way. That's perfectly sensible. Okay. Okay, and uh, so what we're turning to today then is we're turning to, uh, as sort of uh, hinted at by the by, by the check-in, we're we're turning to uh, thinking about the uh, matrix inverses. We're turning to think about finding the uh, finding the inverses. We've been taking linear maps as primary, so we're thinking of the functions as the things that that are uh, that are the main object of study. And uh, we've done uh, function multiplication by a scalar, so you can take 3f. We've done function addition, so you can take f plus g. We've done a function composition, so you can take f composed with g. And here we are doing function inverses. OK, okay so uh, we're going to finish this, this section by thinking about how to represent the inverse of a linear map. So the, basically the goal is if we have a linear map H with an inverse, we want to find the relationship between the representation of H and the representation of H inverse. Did you notice that the bases switched here? This was starting at B, ending at D, but of course the inverse takes you back in the other direction, so the inverse is going to have starting at D, ending at B. Okay, so uh, a, a little quick review on inverses. It's not the you know n not always right on the top of a person's head. So uh, I want to think particularly about uh, two two maps. Uh, I'm going to take the projection routine projection map from uh, from three space to two space. So you project down to the x y plane, and there it is. X y z goes to x y. And then I also want to think about the the embedding map. Uh, that's a Greek letter iota. It's like an I with no dot on top. So the missing dot is intentional. Anyway, so uh, we take x, y, and we send it to some sp some place in R3. Now, if I want that to be a linear map, then 0, 0 has to go to 0, 0, 0. So that's why I took the third entry to be 0. If you sent x, y to x, y, 1, it wouldn't be a linear map. Anyway, so I got what I got here. Now, it's clear that if you do i first, iota first, if you do iota first, and then pi, you go from xy to xy0, and then back to xy again. So it's clear that the composition iota first followed by pi, remember they, they go in the opposite order than the order that you write them, iota first followed by pi is the identity map. It takes you from the two tall column vector xy to the two tall column vector xy via three space, but anyway, it takes you takes you from from the vector v in r squared back to the vector v. But the other way, not so. If you're going to do if you're going to do the the xyz goes to xy and then goes to xy zero. If you start with x, y, 1, you're in trouble. You don't end up back where you started from. So what we're saying here is that this property of the fact that in some sense pi cancels iota can change when you move them around, when you, when you move the functions around so that they come in the opposite order. Order matters for function application. And of course we saw that before when we did that matrix multiplication doesn't commute. We specifically focused on the fact that that's simply because function application doesn't commute. Here's another example, but it's a special case, but it's an important one for us. Okay, so again, if you go from xy to xy0, and then you go from xyz to xy, you cancel, the whole thing cancels out, you end up going from xy to xy. That's the identity map. We say that iota is a right inverse of pi, or pi is a left inverse of iota. The two mean the same thing. That if you compose them in that order, you'll get the identity map. But as we were just talking about, if you do the opposite, if you do pi first and then iota, it doesn't necessarily work. Here's an example of it not working. So you have to call it left inverse and right inverse because it only works on one side. In fact, pi has no left inverse at all. If you're going to go x, y, z to x, y, and then somehow back to x, y, z, the question is, what z? 
well, that's, you, know, you, can't have a, you can't have f take x, y, z to, all, to each one of x, y, 0, and x, y, 1, and x, y, 2, and x, y. If f can't do that, that would make f not a function. Functions have a unique output. So it's possible for a function to have a right inverse but no left inverse, or to have a left inverse but no right inverse. Furthermore, a function can also fail to have an inverse on either side. An example is the 0 transformation on r squared. If, if you send every vector v, every x, y, too tall vector v, to 0, how are you going to invert that? If your input is 0, what's your output? Well, it could be that you started at 1, 2, but it could be that you started at 2, 1. OK, so a function can have a right inverse but no left inverse. A function can have a left inverse but no right inverse. And a function can also fail to have a left inverse, or fail to have a right inverse kind of stuff. So functions are not like numbers. 7 has a 1 over 7. 4 has a 1 over 4. For that matter, 1 over 3 has a 3. But functions can be different. It can be that if you do them from one side, it works. If you do them from the other side, it doesn't. Or it can be that, that, that like the number 0, there just is no, no thing that cancels the function. So function inverse maybe uh, uh, calls for a little review, a little bit different than a person might be used to. Some functions, however, particularly convenient functions, have two-sided inverse. That is, a function that's inverse uh, from both the left and the right. And, the, and an obvious example is if you look at the linear function, v goes to 2v. I won't even tell you the input and output spaces. If v goes to 2v, then the two-sided inverse is v goes to half v. If you first double vectors and then you half them, you end up back where you started from. The appendix shows that a function has a two-sided inverse if and only if it's both one-to-one -one and onto. So a function has a two-sided inverse if and only if it's an isomorphism. If a function has a two-sided inverse, like this function does, doubling and then halving again, doubling has a two-sided inverse, namely halving. If a function has a two-sided inverse, then we just call it the inverse, and we write superscript 1 for the notation. I know there's a potential confusion with 1 over, but this is a standard notation. We, with linear maps, we'll never want to write 1 over, or at least hardly ever want to say such a thing as 1 over. Instead, inverse of the uh, the the composition related inverse it, the, the the map that when you compose with the original gives you back the identity that's what you almost always wanted so that's that's what we use the notation for so in addition you might remember that we had a result that said if a linear map has a two-sided inverse then that inverse is also linear we did it in uh, in the section on isomorphisms because we needed it there and we've just remarked that uh, that two-sided inverse is the same thing as isomorphism. But, but anyway, if a linear map has a two-sided inverse, then the inverse is also a linear map. We saw this up here. v goes to 2v is linear. Also linear is v goes to half v. It's only an example, but it's an illustration. OK, so the, the program for what it is we want to accomplish in this chapter becomes, you give me a matrix H, and I try to find a G that cancels it. Again, you give me a matrix H, and I try to find a G that cancels it, where G times H is the identity, in some way analogous to the sort of seventh grade problem of you give me a 7, and I find a number that cancels it, 1 over 7, the point being that 1 over 7 times 7 is, is the identity element with respect to regular multiplication, the number 1. And of course, it's a right inverse matrix if HG is the identity. And if a matrix H has a two-sided inverse, then we call it an invertible matrix, and the two-sided inverse is denoted H with a superscript 1, H with a superscript 1. Now, so that's the, that's the idea of this chapter. So again, we take the functions as primary and the, and the matrices as computational aspects of the function. It doesn't mean we throw them away, but it means that we've got to take something as primary. Our point of view is that the function is primary. A person sees from how functions work how the matrices are going to work. Sometimes it will be the case that you can find a left inverse matrix that isn't a right inverse. Sometimes it will be the case that you can find a right inverse that isn't a left inverse. Sometimes it will be the case, often it will be the case, that you find a, a matrix that is a two-sided inverse. In that case, th those are particularly convenient matrices. A and uh, a matrix of the two-sided inverse is called an invertible matrix, and we denote it with h superscript minus 1. And so having described what the point of this chapter is, we want to represent 
we want, from the representation of the map, we want to represent the map's inverse, then uh, the next thing to do uh, is to describe what the point is. <laughs> why, why would you want to do such a crazy thing? Uh, so, uh, so here's an illustration of a matrix and a matrix inverse. Uh, two, five, one, three is just some cockamamie matrix. Here's the, uh, uh, here's the inverse. 3 minus 5 minus 1, 2, and you see that when you multiply them together, you get the identity. A person would say, well, how do you get that? So, of course, we're not going to, we can only do one thing at a time. We're not going to talk about that today. We'll talk about that next next video. But uh, we do want to close today with saying, you know, uh, what, why? Given H, why would you want H inverse? What's the point? So here's the idea. Remember the 2, 5, 1, 3? If you have a linear system, whose matrix of coefficients is 2, 5, 1, 3. You can use the H I just figured on the prior slide. You can use it to cancel the 2, 5, 1, 3. Let's focus on the left-hand side of what's happening here. 3 f minus 5 minus 1, 2 by the 2, 5, 1, 3 gives you the identity matrix. That's the point of the 3 minus 5 minus 1, 2. That's the point. Why, why do I want the identity? Because when you multiply the identity by x, y, goes away. So in short, this is like 7 and 1 7th. This is like 3 and 1 3rd. This is like 1 4th and 4. They cancel each other, and when all the smoke clears, you just simply have the variable over there. So it's like 7th grade algebra. Okay, not enough of the left side. I'll look at the right side. Uh, of course, when I, I took this original equation up here and I multiplied both sides by the 3 minus 5 minus 1, 2, of course, you have to do the same thing to both sides. Notice that I do it from the left because with matrices, the order in which you do them, left versus right, uh, uh, matters. So if I did it from the left over here, I got to do it from the left over here. Anyway, I did it from the left. When you do the combination, it's not very interesting. You get a minus 59 and a 23, just some cockamamie numbers, and those numbers are the answer. So if you give me a matrix equation and I know there's an inverse, then finding the answer is trivial. You just take the inverse and multiply it by the constants. That's why I want the inverse, because it makes solving a linear system trivial. If you know the matrix inverse, then it makes solving a linear system easy and quick. Okay. Now, of course, next time, ne next time we're going to talk about some more here with uh, with with solving systems, and I got to show you how you uh, how you figure out the given the matrix, how you figure out what the inverse is, and, and and indeed if there is an inverse. But that's next time. Okay. Very good.